What can you do to support Coming Up Next, the podcast? I hear you asking, friends. It's a show that comes to you for free each and every week, and I know that you feel compelled to want to do something. Well, before I get to my interview with Academy Award-winning producer and writer of Mortal Engines, Philippa Boyens, let me tell you, you can go to comingupnext.com.au where you'll find links to subscribe to the show. Uh, you can also rate it and review it on iTunes. And also, you know, you find the entire back catalogue of, uh, of podcast rambles at comingupnext.com.au. So why don't you do that? And I'm going to get on with the interview. <laughs> Hey folks, how's it going? How is your week been this week? Got a great show for you coming up this week. This is, of course, Coming Up Next, the podcast. You know that because you hit play on Coming Up Next, the podcast. I'm your host, Alistair Marks. Uh, the show has been going for coming up to two and a half, two and a half, coming up to three and a half years now. I don't know where the time is going. Um, but throughout the kind of earlier stages of the show, you probably heard there was a kind of consistent theme with some of the interviews talking about a show that uh, that I had produced with uh, my good friend Samuel Johnson and uh, some other amazing collaborators called Sweatshop. Um, people like Luke McKenzie, Michaela Bannis, Tegan Higginbotham, Paul Verhoeven, Rhys Muldoon uh, all appeared in the show and we spoke at length about the process of making that in the various episodes that you may be familiar with. If you're not familiar with them, you can find them in the archives at comingupnext.com.au. But uh, all this to say that Sweatshop is actually finally having a public release. It's going out into the world. Um, and you, as of tomorrow, uh, tomorrow being Wednesday, if you're listening to this on release day, Wednesday, December the 5th, you'll be able to uh, listen to, listen to, you'll be able to watch uh, all the uh, webisodes for uh, Sweatshop at www.sweatshoptv.com. Um, there'll be four webisodes for your immediate consumption. If you find uh, Sweatshop on Facebook as well, there'll be uh, the episodes released a little bit more um, tantrically. I suppose you might say. It's also heaps of behind-the-scenes content. So if you want to get the lowdown on how. A, uh, an independent TV pilot was produced and crowdfunded uh, circa 2014 now. Uh, you can do all of that at sweatshoptv.com. Big thank you to my guest from last week before we get into this week's guest. Thank you to Aaron Fellows, who is the series producer and director of Louis Theroux's most recent uh, season of, uh, of documentaries, Altered States. Uh, which you can now check out in Australian cinemas. They are, they're a great series of, uh, of documentaries. I mean, Louis Thoreau is one of the all-time greats when it comes to documentary filmmaking, and these three films do not disappoint. Now, I mentioned uh, just before that the Sweatshop uh, release is happening on December the 5th, but on December the 6th, Thursday of this week, Mortal Engines is hitting Australian cinemas and I was very lucky to be invited to a screening of the film in London uh, and got to speak with the film's writer and, uh, and producer, Philippa Boyens. Uh, now, Philippa is an Academy Award winning uh, screenwriter. She won the Oscar in 2004 uh, along with Peter Jackson for their adaptation of The Lord of the Rings, Return of the King. Philippa has been involved in, uh, in adapting all of the Lord of the Rings films, all of the Hobbit films. In fact, she's been involved in, uh, in writing with Peter Jackson and producing with Peter Jackson on most of his films since King Kong. So you could imagine uh, the excitement that I had uh, when I was offered the chance to speak with Philippa Philippa and I got on a call uh, the morning of the launch of Mortal Engines in Sydney. And as I said before, the film opens Australia-wide this coming Thursday, December the 6th. So check your local listings for session times. And in the meantime, here is my interview with Academy Award-winning screenwriter and producer Philippa Boyens. <laughs> I like 
to start my conversations or segue into conversations um, by asking my guest uh, if they remember the first time that they did uh, what they now do now profession what they now do now what they do now uh, uh, professionally if they remember the first time in their childhood that they did that thing ha huh. do I remember when I first wrote something like a screenplay when I was a kid um, uh, mm, I, I, I always used to write stories when I was young from a really early age um, but interestingly enough, I think the most pertinent thing that I did, as far as what I'm doing now, is that I just read a lot of books and watched a lot of movies. <laughs> so um, I think I think <laughs> that love of both those genres has, has actually ended up being what I do now. Are there any uh, any standout books or films that come to mind when you think about that particular oh, time yeah <laughs> one or two um yeah just a little one called the lord of the rings but <laughs> was like my favorite book from <laughs> yeah i had um never ever ever thought about that in terms of a movie but i do actually have a very vivid memory i i had a wonderful childhood i was so lucky i grew up in west auckland um and behind us was a farm it was actually an abandoned farm and it literally uh, had a, a a small creek running through it. it. It also had an abandoned vineyard, so we used to run in and out of the uh, the vines. And I rem and the beautiful little creek which would run through, and we'd go tadpoling and things like that. And I remember lying in the long grass on a really hot day, uh, eating an apple and reading um, Ursula Le Guin. Uh, the Wizard of Earth Sea, and it felt like I was in the book. <laughs> so <laughs> it was one of those moments where you you sort of could visualise yourself being in that world, literally. Um, so yeah, that's a pretty strong memory. Wow, I mean, it must be pretty mind blowing to consider that as a memory, and then fast forward. I I'm not going to venture a guess at how many years into the future, but. A number of years oh, into the quite, future. Quite a few. <laughs> getting a call from Peter Jackson to adapt and produce a uh, screen adaptation of Lord of the Rings. That's a funny story, actually, because um, I was um, actually with... Um, this whole process began with another writer, Stephen Sinclair, who um, I remember he had been talking to them. Um, he's a great playwright, a screenwriter, um, who had collaborated with them earlier on um, Brain Dead and um, Meet the Feebles. And he, uh, I remember him, he had had this phone call with them and he put the phone down and he said to me, you'll never guess what Fran and Peter are going to do next. It's really confidential. I said, I don't know what, I was trying to think. And he said, they're going to do Lord of the Rings. And I just looked at him and said, well, that won't happen. <laughs> <laughs> I thought they were insane. I thought, Who, what are they doing? That you don't exactly see Meet the Feebles and think Lord of the Rings. No, no, but I tell you what, that didn't. That part didn't worry me actually. That it was the book, it was the the vastness, the scale of the thing, but also just how could you create some of these creatures? You know, I I didn't have the understanding of how far along Peter was, especially and Weta was in terms of what they were able to do and what they were able to create. And that's still the case today, I have to say, exactly the same thing. Um, Peter sent me the book for Mortal Engines and um, I read it. He, did, he never tells you anything. He just says, hey, good. have a read of this, see what you think. And I was like, oh my God, <laughs> this is incredible. <laughs> but how are you going to do this? So, yeah, that's, that hasn't changed much over the years, I have to say. It is remarkable to look at the, I guess, evolution of Wingnut as a production company and um, the visual effects studio yeah. as well and to see, to kind of track, you know, from bad taste through to Mortal Engines, the way that 
you know, he really is a visionary in uh, in in a film production sense. He really is. He is. When um, for his fiftieth birthday, um, Fran had found some original footage that he shot when he was a kid, and Weta. It was it was a sequence that he had recreated, um, which was uh, like a homage to um, Ray Harryhausen, the uh, the skeleton fight from Sinbad, and um, he'd redone a, a really, a, quite an extraordinary for his age version, and they actually popped the skeletons in for him <laughs> <laughs> into this, into this, uh, yeah, this, this kid's dream fantasy film that he'd made. It's amazing. Which was a pretty cool thing to do. Yeah. Yeah. And so you grew up in, uh, in West Auckland, you said. Mm-hmm. So what were you doing? Uh, when you got the call from Peter Jackson? Believe it or not, I was working at, um, I was the executive director of the New Zealand Writers Guild. And that guild especially has uh, very close ties to the Australian Writers Guild. In fact, the Australian Writers Guild has always been amazingly good to their fellow Kiwi screenwriters. So big big shout out to them, (laughs) helping support the industry there. And um, uh, that, but but the that role of executive director in New Zealand has, has actually always been held by a writer or for or was often held by a writer. It was a very small, tiny guild and um everyone knew everybody else. Um and I'd sort of stepped up and taken the job on because I felt very passionately as I still do now, um, about funding for the arts. And um, was determined to try and see if we could get more money, and and get more members. And um, we did both, which was great. Um, but in, and in the midst of that, I had begun to get a better understanding about screenwriting myself, um, understanding how it worked and what it really was, and the people that I really admired, how they worked and how they did what they did. Um, so. Yeah, and that's actually how I I met uh, Fran and Pete through through the guild. Yeah, right. And and what was originally. it? What was it like when you did first meet them, and and when they invited you to work with them and collaborate on the Lord of the Rings films? Well, Pete wasn't Peter Jackson then. <laughs> that yeah. makes sense. I mean, he they had an Oscar nom under their belt. I absolutely loved um, Heavenly Creatures. I just remember seeing that and and just falling in love with the aesthetic of it and how they told the story and the imagination and the performances and the skill with which the film was made. So I already was like a fan of theirs in terms of that. Um, so I I was, when I, you know, I sort of did see them as like these uh, people who were far more experienced than I was and far more, um, you know, sort of higher up the scale in terms of, 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 of where they stood in the industry. But the thing is, they never think that way. They don't think that way now when they start working with new people. They just they just approach people as people and, um, you know, they start from a place of respect for each other with your, in terms of your creative talent and, and how you work together. So it was a pretty, we sort of, when they first reached out to me, what happened was they had a 90-page outline. They knew that I was a fan of the books. And it's not that they weren't fans of the books, but they they weren't they weren't like crazy nutty fans like me <laughs> <laughs> who could recite the poetry, who could recite the poetry in the books. And um and so they they wanted to see what I thought. They had also begun to understand that at that stage it was still with Miramax, with the Weinstein brothers, and it was two films. It was going to be two films. And they wanted to see what I thought about this 90-page um, treatment that they'd done. And I was really nervous to read it. But having read it, I started to think. I, my, my whole mindset changed and I started to see, okay, maybe this could be a film. Maybe this could actually work. Um, and so I gave them some notes, and and then um, I met with them. We were talking, and then the next thing I know, they said, would you want to write this with us? And I was like, um, okay. 
And I remember thinking, wow, you know, so well, that'll probably take to the end of the year. That'll be exciting. <laughs> <laughs> and 20 years later? Yeah. I mean, I'd love to dig into Lord of the Rings uh, more, but we're here to talk about uh, Mortal Engines. I'd love to understand, actually, uh, if you're if you're happy to talk about it, what the kind of difference or the evolution for you in terms of the process of adapting Lord of the Rings versus adapting Mortal Engines. Because I know that it was brought to you initially in 2005 and, and you guys actually started to get it up in 2008 before it was put on the back burner. So, yeah, I'd love to sort of understand yes, right. the, uh, the, the, the difference in the process and the way that it might have evolved between the two. It was vastly different. Um the with with Mortal Engines we were able to write the script, write the screenplay first, um before we before we started filming. What happened with the Lord of the Rings after it became green lit by New Line, it was it was pretty much full on and at that stage they'd they'd gone from green lighting it off two scripts to saying, Let's make the three books, let's make three films which completely meant restructuring everything. Um, and then it it was such an evolution as new characters came in, as new actors came in. We worked a lot with the actors um, uh, on The Lord of the Rings. Um, and it was, it, was, it was a crazy kind of process and not the right way to, to do a screenplay, but it was the right way for, the, for that, for those films, as it turned out. Um, because it allowed for endless possibilities. Um, whereas with Mortal, Mortal we, we uh, uh, Peter and Fran actually had uh, owned the rights, I believe, for the books and had set it up with MRC before taking it out to the studios. So when they made the decision, look, the rights are going to expire, we've, we've, you know, it was a do or die kind of, okay, we're going to make this film ever or are we going to let it go? And in the end, uh, once the decision was made, yep, we're going to do it, they wanted to, to write the script before going out to the studios. So that was a very different process of, between the two projects of, of sitting down, understanding that what we felt with Mortal Engines was it wasn't going to be a three-hour movie. It couldn't be a three-hour movie. The book could certainly hold a three-hour movie. There's so much in there. There's so many ideas. But the vastness of this of, of Mortal Engines is very different to the vastness of, of the Lord of the Rings. I mean, you're talking about giant, massive cities on wheels, thundering across the landscape, but with a real ticking clock. And you don't want to, there's a real ticking clock going on and you don't want to take forever to get there for the audience, especially in terms of, of, of the, um, of, of, this being hopefully the first of a few films. You want to introduce the audience to the world, let them fall into that world, hopefully let them relate to those characters and and then get out of the way of what is an extraordinary idea. And we kind of knew that from the beginning going in. Um, and we knew also that there were some big choices that we had to make about what was going to be in and what was going to be out. And with Mortal Engines, that was a lot easier to do than it was for The Lord of the Rings. And it's not just about the fact that Lord of the Rings has, you know, is, is a classic and and is so beloved by literally by hundreds of millions of people and has fans all over the world. Mortal Engines has its own, you know, uh, fan fan base. And Philip's an extraordinary writer. Um, and but he was also actually an extraordinary collaborator um, because we actually met with him and, and talked through what some of these reasonably significant changes were going to need to be that we, were, we felt we were going to need to make in terms of um, bringing the, the book to the screen. Um, so he was, he was, wonderful to work with in terms of he, he never was, he understood that we were going to age the characters up and why we were going to age them up. He understood why we want, wanted the confrontation that we wanted, not not the, in, in the books, you have a, uh, a confrontation first between London 
and then another giant um, another giant predator city, but it's not a real battle in the book. So it's not a real two, you know, behemoths going head to head. It's it's a, it's different, and and then the city rolls on, and then ultimately confronts the great static settlements they call them in the book of the east, Shanghua. So we knew that you know we weren't going to do that double beat of two confrontations. He understood that, and um, hopefully, if there is, a, I feel like I'm pitching you a sequel. If there is a sequel, we will get to see giant cities battling each other. But at the moment. Um, you know, it's it's it was it was that process of, of having a, a much stronger sense of okay, we're going to have to lose this, we're going to have to lose that. In the book, you have actually two sets of great characters that you're following. At its heart, and as as the series of books goes on, it is really all about Hester Shaw. It is Hester Shaw's story. But in the book, you also have uh, Catherine Valentine, who's played by brilliant Australian actress, by the way, Layla George, who we love. Um, and her story is it is the other half of the book. Um, and along with the character of Bevis, Bevis Pod. And what we knew was that we couldn't tell both those stories, the story of Hester Shaw and Tom Natworthy, and then the story of Catherine and Bevis and give them equal weight and, and you know, do justice to both and make a two-hour film. So really early on, we knew that this was going to be Tom and Hester's story. And that's why we've made some changes, which I won't do any spoilers here, in terms of how we tell the Catherine and Bevis story. Um, so we've told part of that story, maybe not all of it. <laughs> and hopefully maybe we can get to tell the rest of it. Um, but yeah, so I, I don't know. I guess experience. We brought a lot more experience, of course, for, to to the process, um, having lived through the Lord of the Rings, but also um, learnt a lot. I have to say on this one as well. I think you always learn with everything that you do um, on film. Every film you make, every script you write, is a learning process. And I think the day that I stop doing that is the day I should probably get out of the business, but I did. I felt like I learned a lot uh, doing this. You know, being that disciplined, trying to uh, stay focused on what was important in, in terms of the story, and also, like I said before, just getting the way out of a great idea. Yeah, I think the way that the story unfolds is, uh, you know. I I I'm certainly sold on the uh, on the pitch for the sequel. I think um, you know there is there's, <laughs> on, there's only so much that you can fit into, as you say, uh, 120, 130 minutes. Um, particularly when there's an aesthetic that needs to be established as well. Um, was there or what were the kind of? Uh, I mean, aside from the obvious challenges what were the i guess the day-to-day -day challenges that you felt like uh you 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 found with this particular production on a day-to-day -day basis uh just the usual this is me with my producer's hat on i guess my executive producer's hat on just making sure that that everyone was supported in the way that they needed to be that we were going to get our day that christian felt uh, christian rivers who directed the movie felt like the story was playing the way that it should play, and that um, that that the pace of the film was working. All of those sort of things that you sort of you always wonder: well, oh, how is that moment going to work? Is it going to work? Is it actually going to be funny? Was it funny? Um, uh, the, this 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 the book has got lots of wonderful uh, gags in it, and we could have had endless gags. Trust me about. Um, the notion that we, this civilization that you and I are in right now, doing a podcast, are the ancients. We are the we are the the, the equivalent to um, the people of mortal engines uh, as ancient Egyptians. You know that they they dig up what we left behind, and some sometimes they understand, they can make sense of it, and then other times they've got absolutely no idea how um, what this thing is or what what it was used for. 
and 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 it's also not just our era it's 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 all the eras that came before us as well that they dig up so they've been kind of smashed together and to create this whole new world which is the world of mortal engines so we could have kept going for a long time i have to say doing a lot of gags about that um about dropping iphones down toilets and things like that <laughs> but we just <laughs> but but you at some point you just know okay well we've got to let it go you just gotta you just gotta stay focused we had a lot of fun also on set. We had great cast. Um, you know, any day you get to have Hugo Weaving and step up on set is a good day, I have to say. So he was wonderful to work with yet again. But, as, I, you know, challenges, every day is a challenge when you're making a film. Not being daunted is really important. And I learned that from Peter. It's just stay focused just achieve a little bit every day, keep moving forward. Um, that's the single most important thing that you can do, especially with these big projects that uh, have so, so many threads that ultimately have to be pulled together. And how do you, I guess, when you begin a project, say when you began one of the Lord of the Rings films or when you begin uh, something like Mortal Engines, do you kind of set, uh, a collective focus or a collective kind of philosophy or idea of uh, how you're how you're going to define the success of the production, or is it just something that sort of organically happens? Well, to be truthful, honestly, there's, there's, there's you know there's the obvious financial realities of making a film with this budget that you owe a responsibility to the studio who were brave enough to put that money up to to deliver a film that that hopefully going to have a broad appeal um we this film is based on a book that that is often referenced as young adult the ya genre um but for us it never felt like that it didn't feel like more legends sat in that world of the young adult um sort of hunger games sort of er area it felt it could carry you know the eight to eighty age age range that you get from films like The Lord of the Rings, Star Wars, you know, Harry Potter, those sort of, um, that sort of genre of film, not exclusively aimed at teenagers. So uh, we wanted to make sure we could deliver a film that could deliver for that broad an audience. And also deliver on the fact that, you know, immediately when you say the concept, you say giant cities on wheels that consume other little traction towns, you've got the eight-year-old to, you know, 18-year-old boys already. You've already got them because they just want to see that stuff. I've got a little eight-year-old boy who just probably wants the toys. <laughs> Where's the toys? I want the giant <laughs> city. Um, and, and so you've got that, you've got that demographic. It was, but, but at the heart of Mortal Engines, there's this incredible story of a young girl and we have this fantastic actress, Tara Hilmer, playing Hester Shaw. And what has been so good from the screenings that we've been having is the response from women. And they go, oh, my God, this is, I love this film. This is totally the film I want to bring my daughters to. I want my daughter to see this film. Um, so that's been really satisfying, being able to deliver on that. So the expectations, I guess, to get back to the question that you asked, the expectations are always that, the film's going to find its audience, the audience that you created it for, and um, and that they're going to love it, that they're going to enjoy it. Um, but in the end, you have to let it go, yeah, which is what we're doing right now. This is the process that you do is you put it out there and deliver it into the hands of the audience, and they tell you what they think. <laughs> Does that process ever get easier? No. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's terrifying. <laughs> We're going to do a screening today, uh, a fan event today in Sydney, um, which I'm really looking forward to. I just, I want to see, I want to see what people, which, which bits are working, you know, like feel it with, genuinely with the fans of, of the book, fans of, um, of that sort of genre and see how, how they receive it. So that's going to be really interesting. Amazing. Yeah. Well, I hope it goes really well. And so if, if you hear anything about me jumping off the Harbour Bridge tomorrow morning, <laughs> you can assume <laughs> it didn't go very well. <laughs>
Thank you so much, but, yeah. Philippa, for, uh, for, for jumping on the call and having a, uh, an early morning ramble. Um, I, uh, I end no, all, of my, all of my conversations with the same question. question is, what makes you silly? What makes me go silly or what makes me silly? I'll tell you what happened last night. Last night we were having dinner and I was trying to remember a film that I had literally just seen that was really good. And I'd really enjoyed it. And I was having this conversation with Christian and Fran. And they were going, what was it? And I was going, I can't remember. Oh, my God, I can't remember. And they were like, well, who was in it? And I was like, I don't know. It was really good. Well, what was it about? Oh, my God, I can't remember. And I knew, because I was tired, I, I knew I was going to wake up at 2 o'clock in the morning. And I did. At 2 o'clock this morning, I woke up and went, 22nd July, Paul Greengrass. And it was- it was one of those moments where it was like, see, I knew my brain would catch up, and it did. It just caught up at two in the morning. <laughs> so there you go. And I think the reason I couldn't remember it was because it didn't have a lot of famous people in it that I knew of. And and also, it when they said, was it a documentary, it kind of felt a little like maybe it had been a documentary. But anyway, that makes me pretty silly, I think. That's pretty silly. It is pretty silly. Thank you so much, Philippa. Thank you.